as we just continue in our worship time again. Help us to come and be in the position of giving you everything we have in worship, but also the ears to hear, Lord, what you want to say this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask if uh, you take out your outline that's there. If you are online, actually, you can do this here too. If you go to mynbc.life, there's a card there that is about today's message, and there's notes you can take. The verses of Scripture are there. You can go there online. Uh, you have that in front of you. The difference is you can take notes online, and at the end of that, it, you can actually put your email in, and it will send them back to you, so you have all those to print out or keep digitally, whatever you want. We've been, uh, talk we started talking about grace. And that's, and that's not Sue D'Antuono's daughter. It's just a daughter named Grace. Eh? There was an article in the San Diego Union a while back. The scene was the San Diego Superior Court. Two men were on trial for armed robbery. And an eyewitness took the stand, an eyewitness, right? And, and the prosecutor got, uh, got up and began his questioning. And he said, first he said to the eyewitness, were you at the scene of the robbery? Yes, I was. You saw a vehicle leave at a high rate of speed. Yes, I did. Did you see the occupants of that vehicle? Yes, I did. Then he turns and faces the courtroom and says, and are those two men in this courtroom today? And both criminals raise their hand. <laughs> We're going to be talking a little bit of a... You're going to... You stay with me here. We're talking about grace, obviously. Grace, not j just something said before a meal. Uh, it's God's grace. Um, and and uh, but we're gonna we're gonna. Last week we talked. We built this foundation of what's God's grace, right? Uh, and I, I, this is gonna sound a little contrary. Just just stick with me. We actually want to talk about guilt today. Grace and guilt. Um, because the truth of, is every one of us, right, honestly, if we're honest, say, we, there's some point in our life where we have to go, yeah, like the criminals, I did it, right, I did it. There are things that we've all struggled with. There are, there, there's this way that we are all in the same boat when it comes to this. In fact, this is a hard verse for us because uh, that I want to share with you. It's simply because we tend to think of all of this from our human perspective, not from God's perspective. Listen to James 2, verse 10. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. Well, that's not fair. And, and it's because we, we you know, it, obviously when it comes to the way that we evaluate guilt... There are different degrees. Some people, when they commit a crime, deserve certain things to happen. It might just be a speeding ticket. Or it could be you got to pay a fine. Or it could be you got to go to jail. That's what we call justice, right? But with God, we need to understand that it's not the number of sins that separate us from God. It could only be one. And that one sin in my life will separate me from God just as much as, well, the thousand that's in your life, you know, uh, that, that type of thing. Sin separates us from God. It's not about quantity. In order to have an orderly society, we, we have to deal out justice differently. I don't want to go to jail because I happen to be going a little fast on post road, you know, that type of thing. So this passage here in James is talking about God's justice, recognizing the fact that whether it's one sin or many in our lives, we've all slipped. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We're all in that same, without Jesus, sinking boat. So I want to look at this and, and have us come away with understanding, but God has an answer to this. So 
let's look at a few questions. First off, what is guilt, right? We all know what that feels like. So there's this verse in the Bible that reminds us what it feels like. It's from Psalm 38. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Hmm. I, I think we understand that, that overwhelming, burdened feeling sometimes. That feeling of, whew, hope nobody finds out about this one. Right? But is that all there is to guilt? Is that what God meant guilt to be? Is that some kind of punishment that he sends our way or into our life, into your life, that, that when we've done something wrong, he says, all right, you did it, now you've got to live with it for a while. Does he mean for us to do that, you know, for a while? And maybe even the rest of your life now, that's the punishment, that's your guilt, you've got to live with that. And the answer is no, that's not God's intention. The purpose of guilt is not just to make us feel bad. God has a much greater purpose than that. Guilt, think of it this way. Guilt is actually a warning light. That's a fill in the blank on your sheet. Guilt is a warning light. Picture it that way. Right? It's a warning light that goes off and says something's wrong. Something needs to be fixed. Think about the warning light that comes on in your car be a check engine light some people call them idiot lights because you know there's a but like the check engine light think about the, the the light that goes off on the dashboard and and it says basically <laughs> something's wrong something's wrong with the car here and does it help to ignore the light or to disconnect the light no it's it's saying something's wrong so just to go with that example just Watch this video for a minute. If your check engine light is on, mm -hmm. typically that's an indicator to, you know, check your engine. It's fine. It's been on for like a month. Well, actually, that would be all the more reason to, you know, check your engine. Sheldon, it's fine. If it were fine, the light wouldn't be on. That's why the manufacturer installed that light, to let you know it's not fine. I don't know. Maybe the light's broken. Is there a check the check engine light light? <laughs> oh. Your check engine light turn, is on. Turn that off there. Um, I love that. It's and, and that's a theme, by the way, throughout the seasons of Big Bang. Uh, other people say that until that one episode where the car breaks down. Say that, that it actually plays out. But see, that's kind of the way we, we deal with guilt once in a while, isn't it? We try to ignore it. We try to pretend that it's not there. And, and, and we got lots of different ways of dealing with the warning light that God sends into our lives. But the truth is, if something's really wrong, the best thing to do is we got to get it fixed. Now, speaking personally, if I tried to fix my car when the warning light went on, that would be a problem because I am not very good at that. Now, the illustration may fall down if you're really good at that. But let's say it's something that you can't even figure out. There's something there. There's, there's one place you can go. you got to go back sometimes to the manufacturer, don't you? And that's, a, that's the, the point of dealing with guilt in our lives. What's the warning light saying? It's saying, guess what? You need some alone time with God. You need God to heal something in you. That, that's the warning light that God gives us through guilt. I'm going to look at that for a moment, but let's, let's, we have to distinguish between what's real guilt and what's not, okay? So there is this, first off, there's, there's genuine guilt. Okay. The real deal. And every one of us has dealt with that. And every one of us will continue to deal with that, right? The, the genuine guilt that comes from the fact that, that we've all done wrong things that have either hurt ourselves, hurt others, hurt the heart of God. And unless we're perfect, and we're not, we've all had to deal with this genuine feeling of guilt. 
But there's another brand of guilt that's very important to understand if you're going to get past this and find God's answer to in, in, in the midst of it. There is a false guilt as well. And that's thinking, false guilt would be thinking that maybe the light on the dashboard is going to come on and you're worried about that. It's not on yet, but you're worried that it might come on and you worry yourself into a feeling of guilt. That feeling's like, oh, man, if that light ever came on, what would people think of me? There's a, there's a, a lot of people that deal with false guilt. And, and if you deal with false guilt, you're going to hear things like this. I just have this overwhelming feeling of guilt. I don't know where it comes from. I can't really put my thumb on it. I don't know the source of it. But I just feel bad. So if you're dealing with, with false guilt, you're probably sending yourself a lot of mental emails, okay? And they read something like this. You think that's enough? You call that acceptable? Look at all the things you haven't gotten done. You've disappointed the people that are around you. And if that's the kind of things you're hearing a lot, then you're dealing with false guilt. We need to understand that often false guilt lives in our lives. If we struggle a lot with this, it's often, actually, sometimes it's, it's not even, it's there because it's not even our fault. There, there are people, a lot of people who struggle the most with, with false guilt. It's there because they were caught up in the circle of somebody else's sin in some point in their lives. It could be a, a parent, a friend. It could be mental, physical, emotional abuse. But, but somehow at an early age you were caught up in the cycle of somebody else's sin and you feel like you just can't get out of that in your life. But there's also uh, times that false guilt is there because you simply just, you can't get past your past. And this is where you'll hear people say, you know, I have asked God a thousand times to forgive me and I still don't feel forgiven. And that's you not getting past your past. Way back in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, Paul talked to some people struggling with false guilt. They're trying to make themselves better by doing a lot of good things. And he wrote them in Galatians 3.3, 3, and it says this. You began your life in Christ by the Spirit, and now you're trying to make it complete by your own power? That is foolish. But that's the sign of what happens when we struggle with false guilt. We don't feel forgiven by God so we try to do more and more to make it better in our own power I think one of the best things we can do as we talk about guilt is to know the difference between real and false guilt how do you know the difference how do you know if it's God speaking to you in that moment or maybe it's you know sister Margaret from parochial school or brother Bob from some fundamentalist church that you are at or how do you know who's really speaking to you? So can I just really quickly give you three tests? Three tests that will help us determine, discern whether this is from God or not. Number one, is the focus on people or on God? Someone said, false guilt is that which comes as the result of the judgment and suggestions of people. In other words, true guilt is that which comes as a result of divine judgment what God thinks about the situation but if you're struggling with false guilt you're going to find your maybe you're finding yourself trying to find a whole lot of approval from other people you're an approval junkie you need other people's approval to make you feel better about yourself and you need that daily fix and you need more and more just to help you feel better about yourself. And the real problem with that is you're struggling with false guilt and man, life, you just get worn out. Because let me tell you, it's hard enough for me to live up to my own expectations. If I have to live up to everybody else's, that's exhausting, right? And it wears you out. Is it people or is it God? Another test would be this. Is it vague or specific? Because sometimes people say things like, well, I have this cloud of doubt. I, it's a fog of 
guiltiness and, and they don't know how to get rid of it. You know? And so what does that lead back to? And, and go, well, I, I don't know. You know, what struggle have, uh, are you facing? I, I can't put my finger on it. And I got to say, almost all the time when it's vague, a vague, vo- uh, foggy feeling of guilt, that's not God. And actually, Satan loves to do that. And he wants to tell us we've done something wrong, you know, and, but it's just a general thing, right? See, God, God doesn't work that way. God, when he wants to tell us we've done something wrong, he wants to help us get it right, he does it like a pinpoint of light, doesn't he? It's not this vague, cloudy thing. You know, I, I heard the sermon, and it was like, just like God just pointed this thing out to me. I turned on Caleb, and there's this song, and it's about the same thing, you know? And, and I was watching a rerun of Big Bang, and you know what? They were talking about the same thing. You know, it's, it, God just uses these things to get very specific in our lives. Right? So it's not this vague yeah, I'm just guilty. I've, I, I've met people. I remember in college, you know, I, I, I just called him an Eeyore Christian. Oh, well, woe is me, sinner that I am. It's not talking about specifics. That was his life. He was always just feeling guilty and not worthy and all of this stuff. And I don't think God wants us to live that life, right? So if there's something that God wants you to deal with, he's going to point it out. Here's what's wrong, and this is how we're going to fix it. And then there's this one, rules or relationship. When you're struggling with false guilt, the big feeling is I broke the rules. When you're struggling with genuine guilt, it's usually I hurt someone. I hurt my wife or my husband, my children. I hurt the heart of God because of what I did and that's the difference between the two the rules become in false guilt the rules become more important than the relationship so it becomes religion not relationship in the church it's about duty rather than the heart's desire false guilt blinds us to the miraculous work of God and it and it binds us to this meticulous list of rules you know, and, and usually they're people's rules, you know. What would you rather have? So wh- whatever kind of guilt we're dealing with, true f- or false, we've got our ways of dealing with it, and then we've got God's way of dealing with it. So we're, we're heading in that direction here, right? So back to the light on the dashboard. What are you going to do when the light comes on? How do you handle it? And it's amazing how we have some common ways of handling guilt. They go all the way back to first man, first woman, first sin, right? You know that story, right? It's Adam and Eve. God says, Adam, Eve, here's a garden. It's a wonderful place. It's paradise. And you have free reign over that. One rule, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's all I'm asking. Just don't do that. Because on that day, you will surely die death will enter into your life Um, and of course we know the story satan represented by the serpent comes in and tempts them questions gets them to question god did god really say and all this and and it tells us that he looks at the fruit it looks so good that's where we get the term forbidden fruit by the way right it looks so good that she eats it and then she gives it to adam and he eats it and all of a sudden everything changes so here's some verses out of that story that tell how they responded okay it's from genesis 3 they first sewed figs together and made something to cover themselves that's because they felt shame then they hid from the lord because they were afraid you know and when challenged, Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. And it was a shame, and God's going to find out. And then he, another part of that is, and she gave me the fruit of the tree, so I ate it. Three ways that are indicated 
by the way they responded that are similar to the ways we still, re we still do this, okay? Sometimes we just we respond to guilt with shame. We respond to our sin with, with shame, and we feel bad about it. And sometimes we even feel, you know what, if I can just feel bad enough about that wrong, that will make it okay. And if you've tried that, you know that doesn't work. Shame doesn't work. So they sowed the, f you know, they, they saw that they were naked, they were ashamed, they sowed fig leaves, and then they tried to hide. That's the next one. We hide. Okay? They hid in the bushes from God as if God couldn't see them, right? As, as if God's not, does, oh, where are they? You know, that's not God, right? It's, it's, but it's like trying to put your hand over the light on the dashboard that's going off, pretending, no, that's, that's not, there's no light there, you know? We'll hide it. And that doesn't work either. But they tried that one. They hid out. And then here's the one I think that is really one of the ones that's our default. And then there's the blame game. Right? That's the popular one. So this is a sort of tragic, humorous story of what happens in Genesis. You got Adam and Eve and the serpent. They're all there. And God comes and God asks Adam, did you eat from the fruit of that tree? And Adam took it like a man. Blamed his wife. He points right at Eve and said, she did it. It's her fault. And he doesn't even end there. He actually wants to put blame on God too. And by the way, the woman that you put here, she told me to eat and I ate it. So Eve's standing there and she's blaming too. Now <laughs> that's the serpent. The serpent did it. And of course, you know, he didn't have a leg to stand on. So. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> happens all the time it's easy to blame your way out of the things that we've done we all do this right it's always it, it's it's somebody else's fault that's sometimes how we handle guilt but god has a way of handling guilt what's this series about grace this is the way God handles guilt. It's very different from our ways. So here's this verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And if you look at that verse, if you got your, if you're using your sheets, whatever, for, uh, circle, if we confess our sins... That's part of dealing with guilt. It's part of God's grace. Circle, he's faithful and just, because the truth is that's also a part of God's grace and how it works. And then circle will forgive us. Those are the three things in that verse. That's how we, this is how God means us to deal with guilt, right? Confess your sins. You say, God, I did it. I did it. I confess my sin. Not just our need, our sin. Not, not just our frustration, our sin. Not just our problems, our sin. And, and there's a lot of fancy definitions out there of sin. I think maybe the easiest way for us to understand sin is there's a letter in the middle of the word sin. The letter I. Because it's all about me. It's about my way. It's all about me. Sin is, is ultimately about me saying to God, excuse me, but I'm going to live my life my own way. See, that was original sin. Satan's temptation was if you eat of that fruit, then you will be like God. You get to be like God. Right? God, I got my own plans. I'm going to do it my way. That's sin. And whether you look very moral in the eyes of our world or very immoral, you, you can still have that eye right in the middle of your life and leave God out. Because that's what sin is all about. Confession is telling God, God, I left you out. And because of that, I messed up and my life's got messed up. And see, when it comes to sin, we can do one of two things. We can cover up or we can face up. And when we try to cover it up and pretend it's not there or blame somebody else 
doesn't work, but when we face up to it, the number one thing we need to do is to tell God, God, I'm facing this. I'm, I'm owning this. And how do you confess your sin? You just tell God. We call that prayer, right? And you, by the way, you might as well tell him because he already knows. It's not like you're really hiding anything from God, right? So you might as well enter into this relationship part that God has for us. He already knows, so just be honest about it. The psalmist tells us that in Psalm 69, verse 5. Oh God, you are aware of my foolish sins, and my guilt is not hidden from you. So it's nothing more difficult to try to hide something that can't be hidden, by the way. See, you know, there's nothing more worrying and nothing more costly. So why do we try even to hide it from God? Just tell him and be honest with him. Telling God, confessing to God. means, And it means more than just admitting. Actually, in, in that word, it's, it's, a, its meaning is saying the same thing about. It's confession is saying to God, I agree with you about this. It was wrong. It was sin and it hurt. I agree with you about this sin. I agree with you that it is sin. And again, you just do that by telling God. Talk to God. And, and, and I know this, there may be some thinking, you know, you don't know how many times I've confessed this particular sin. It may have happened 20, 25 years ago. I've talked to God about it again and again and again. I still don't feel forgiven. So here's a part of it too. How do, it's the next part of that verse. How do we feel God's forgiveness? How do we sense God's forgiveness? How do we embrace God's forgiveness? Okay. So we not only confess our sins, but we need to trust God's character. That's the other thing. You trust God's character. Because, you see, here's the thing. Uh, many people confess their sins, but they really ne never get to know the God who's forgiving them. And because of that, they're never going to feel the forgiveness that he wants to give. He is faithful. He is just. You trust God's character in this. Because you can count on God. You can count on his faithfulness. And, and, and I think that there are some people who can't get close to God because they don't feel forgiven. Right? That's why I don't feel forgiven, so I can't get close to God. And actually, that's a trap. Because the truth is, the closer you get to God, the more you're going to feel forgiven. See, when you and I get close to God who loves us, who, who gave his life for us, in Jesus Christ, when we get close to him, we really sense, we begin to sense what forgiveness is all about. So as long as you're holding God at arm's length, you're not going to feel his forgiveness. Look at his invitation in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, trusting in him having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Isn't that great? Jesus makes us free of a guilty conscience, and that's what the cross is all about. That's what him giving his life for us is all about. Because once I've accepted his gift, the invitation is draw, draw near to me. Get close to me. And when we get close to God and we understand His grace, we'll begin to understand it in a new way. And that helps us become the person that God wants us to be. That never happens in guilt. You don't become the person God wants you to be through guilt. You become the person God wants you to be through His grace. And so you can trust God. He is faithful. We confess our sins. We trust who God is. And thirdly, we accept that forgiveness. We confess our sins. He's faithful. He can be trusted to forgive us our sins. And the verse ends by saying, and then he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad that that three-letter word is in there? That's such an important three-letter word, all. Right? not some of our 
you know, r unrighteousness, or most of our unrighteousness even. It's all. Hmm. John 3.18, here's the promise. People who believe in God's Son are not judged guilty. God's grace. When we believe in Jesus and trust what he did for us on the cross, the Bible says you are not judged guilty. So if you've already trusted in Christ and believed in what he's done, then don't judge yourself guilty when God's already said, I judge you not guilty. And if you've never trusted in, in, in what Christ has done for you and his willingness to forgive you, you know, Man, what an offer that he extends to you. Why not take advantage of that? He's willing to say to you, not guilty. We have this picture, you know, <laughs> we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be at the pearly gates, you know, and, and that's when we're going to be judged guilty or not guilty. Can I tell you something? That's not where it begins. It actually begins right now. Today, you can actually settle that issue. God is willing through Christ to say, Jesus paid it all, so I judge you not guilty. Because you deserve it? No, I, we don't deserve that. That's why it's grace. But because of God's grace, we can accept God's forgiveness. So one last verse. It's from Psalm 32, verse 5. Finally, I confessed all my sin to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. Amen. Incredible. Now, I think some of us need the first half of that verse. Finally, I confessed all my sins and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And, and, and if that's where you're at, then, then you need to say, God, I admit it. I need your forgiveness. I'm tired of trying to figure this out on my own and trying all my ways to make up for it. And some of us need the second half of that verse. And you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. And maybe the saddest part is for some people, it takes them 10, 15, 25 years or a lifetime to get from the first half to the second half of that verse. Don't let it be that way with you. Recognize that he's the God of grace who wants to forgive and shower that grace upon you because he loves us. So let's take a moment to talk to God about what, we've, what I've just said today and Admit our sins to God. Talk to Him in your heart and say something like, Father, I confess my sins to you today. I agree with you. There's things I've done that are wrong. They, they've hurt me. They've hurt others. They've hurt you. And I'm, trying to, I'm tired of trying to make up for them on my own. Would you just, Lord, forgive me. Thanks for sending Jesus to die on the cross so they could be forgiven. Thank you that he paid the penalty for my sins. I trust you. I trust your character today. You're faithful. You will forgive me. And today, as best as I know how, I accept your forgiveness into my life. Help me to begin to live out that life of grace today. Father, help me to live your life by grace and not guilt. Help me to step into the fresh air of your grace today. And that's a little scary, I know. But today I'm making a commitment to take you at your word and to trust you that Jesus paid the price for all of my guilt and it's gone. Amen.